we're here for a live AMA. This is a space where Immutable X just brings along all our partners and customers, and we just want you to get to know them, um, introduce these partners and customers to the Immutable X community, but also the Immutable X community to get to know some of our customers as well. Before we get right into it, uh, Lachlan, Rudy, could you do a quick introduction? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm Lachlan. I'm one of the, the founders of PX Quest. Um, I'm obviously Australian <laughs> and uh, Australian based. Um, I've actually been uh, following the Immutable X journey the last couple of years. I kind of knew some of the guys way back when you were just starting out. Uh, and so it's been really fascinating to see Immutable X grow um, from a small team to a big team and, and to kind of be uh, privy to some of the the teething and lessons and, and whatnot as you've, as you've grown, that's um, helped us a lot in terms of helping us get things right um, from the beginning. Uh, and also we're just kind of super stoked to see a genuine Australian unicorn kind of come out come out of the Sydney heartland. Um, so <laughs> keen, keen backers of IMX and we, we kind of have uh, been thinking about building something on IMX for a while. So PX Quest was um, kind of a great opportunity that uh, came along for us. Um, I was previously a, a partner at a, a firm doing AI natural language solutions uh, and including like full stack and, and cloud engineering as well. Um, and I, I've always had a bit of a graphic design side as well. So NFTs were kind of this beautiful uh, synergy of two things I really loved, uh, art and uh, innovative technology. Uh, and when uh, the space really started kicking off uh, last year, it was kind of clear to me that there was an opportunity there I couldn't turn down. and so. Uh, I made the big leap and, and quit my job and, and committed full time to, uh, to making something beautiful, as I, as I like to say to the team, we, we've got to make something beautiful. Um, and, you know, as someone that's really inspired by um, the games I played as a kid and as a, a teenager and, and particularly moved by art and music in games um, and some of the work that, say, like Riot has done lately from cinematics to, um, to some of their um, major titles. Uh, we we knew we kind of had to make something, maybe not of a, a similar scale because we obviously don't have their budget, but definitely of a similar level of um, kind of art and statement. Um, so <laughs> that's why we knew we knew we wanted to make something uh, gaming, and we knew we wanted to make something with a strong artistic flavor to it. And I think that comes across just in the quality of our pixel art. But you'll also see as we start doing game sneak peeks that it's got a really distinct style that um, I'm personally very excited about, and I, I hope the the market appreciates it um, and, and the time we've put into it as well. Um, yeah, I'll let, I'll let Rudy take over and uh, tell you his, uh, his hopes and dreams from childhood. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, a bit of a, a funny background. I studied uh, design first at university and studied um, business later. Uh, so my experience after uni finish has mainly been in big tech companies, uh, more around business operations, uh, account management, business development. Uh, kind of so I, uh, if it wasn't clear, Lachlan's a more technical um, I, uh, PX Quest, and I'm taking care of operations. So uh, jack of trades, hopefully, for a couple. Uh, cover everything ranging from, you know, arming up our art teams to building relationships with our development partners and so forth. But I think uh, more importantly, Lachlan and what Lachlan and I have in common is that you know we're very keen gamers. So I grew up on, um, you know, Nintendo's like Game Boy. Uh, GameCube, um, you know, instead of studying in high school, you could find me at your local internet cafe, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, I transitioned over to a lot of Blizzard's offerings over time, and, you know, I still play Hearthstone, and um, same with Lachlan, anything that Riot, Riot Games produces, I I'm a massive fan of just the um, artistic flair and the quality um, that they bring um, is just something that I really look up to. So, um, you know, I've been following the crypto space um, for a while, and I think last year was when Early last year is when uh, NFTs came onto my radar, and I think it's probably pretty common, but NFTs are a pretty hot topic um, in the office these days. And um, I think at first, uh, NFTs didn't really make a lot of sense because, you know, there was all these tokens, but I, I getting a lot of attention, but, you know, very limited um, utility. Um, but I think what I saw is that when it came to gaming, it really became clear how um, blockchain um, technology um, could be used. And so I think that kind of set the stage for a lot on my interest in um, the NFTs and how it could be applied um, in the gaming space. Awesome. Glad to see two strong gamers coming to the space and we're definitely uh, focusing on gaming as well. So it's a match made in heaven for sure. So would love to know more about how did PX Quest come about? How, 
was this your first foray? Was this uh, an, a product of multiple different experiments? Uh, what's the origin story? So um, we, we had a really interesting journey. We actually uh, tried a, a project back in um, like September, August, September last year. Um, with our focus being on a card battler, which is obviously more Rudy's passion. Um, I play more of the MMORPGs. Um, so we started a project called Minted Minions, which uh, we put on ice since. Um, and that was our, our learning experience. That was our steep learning curve um, coming from the tech space where we're, we're kind of big into um, iterating and, and trying and failing quickly and, um, you know, eventually breaking through. So uh, we tried Minions and, and that was our experience where we worked out really the community management side that we hadn't had much exposure to in our previous experience. So um, we had a clear idea of what we wanted to build. And I think we had really strong artwork, but we didn't understand quite how the NFT community worked and quite how to engage an audience and grow an audience. Um, so we basically never hit uh, the, the critical threshold. We got to kind of um, like October even last year, and we were still trying to run that project uh, while also experimenting with with PX Quest as a different brand. Uh, and uh, it became really evident that uh, there were a few things we could change that would would radically improve our stakes. And so we said, um, let's uh, let's cut our losses, let's put this one on ice, uh, and let's do things differently and see if that works. Uh, which is painful when you've put a lot of effort into art and and to building up, um, you know, one style of gameplay and and uh, the focus on that. Um, but I think uh, goes to our perseverance to make sure that whatever we do ends up being a, a success. So we didn't even go to Mint with that one. We weren't uh, we weren't wanting to go to Mint until we were 100% certain we could deliver everything um, for our holders. So we didn't go to Mint with that one. We uh, we started PX Quest with a different style, with more of the pixel meta, um, with much more of a focus and a plan from the beginning as to how we were going to build our community. Um, and we also recruited um, Maui, who was our, our community manager through that um, phase, uh, who already had a lot of key connections uh, and basically got us the exposure that we didn't have um, previously for Minions. Um, so that, that that was kind of our, our learning experience. Uh, but I think our, our origins in terms of how we chose to style PX Quest um, came a little bit out of lessons learned there and, and also just from watching the space change um, and particularly just some noises being made out of bigger players that might um, start to move into the space uh, maybe like next year. Uh, but also seeing games like Alluvium coming through, looking at the success of um, Guild of Guardians, like as a, as a role model, they're, they're a really good role model and Gods Unchained um, and feeling that we probably needed to actually up what we we're offering beyond a simple card battler. Um, so I'll let Rudy take it from there in terms of um, yeah, the, the thoughts around PX Quest in particular. Yeah, I, I think just an important thread that just kept coming through is just how important the community is and community feedback. And the NFT space is such a, a fast moving space and not saying that you have to, you know, quickly change everything based on, you know, what's happening in the market, but finding that balance between um, your own vision of what you want to build and be innovative in the space and then, you know, spread the word about what you're doing, but also um, having a good feel um, for, you know, what the community wants and what the community values. And it was just a very strong um, focus on utility um, of our token as well, which we, you know, we can go into a bit more um, detail about later. So, yeah, that's all I really wanted on that. Yeah, I guess we learned the value of utility in particular. Like I think with Minions, we were super focused on we we'll just build a great game that happens to have, you know, NFTs as its art. And really we got the the balance all wrong. Really, we needed to start with, okay, well, here are here are NFTs. How do we how do we actually give them independent utility, lasting utility? Um, and how do we make a great game that that mirrors that and supports that, but that both of them need to be able to stand on on their two feet on their own. Awesome. You mentioned learning is about community. What are the things that you want to share to your community now that you know you're going to do right? Yeah. So if you're if you're starting a project, the, the biggest lesson we learned was how important uh, partner collaborations were. We didn't actually understand that when we started Minions. We, were, we just tried to go out there and we, I think we did a lot of the content stuff right. We had events in the server. We had a whole like puzzle game system for leveling up. We had puzzles on the website. We were very like uh, mini game kind of focused. Uh, what we didn't get is really that initial broadcast piece that you need to do, which is just at least get yourself in the faces of a certain number of people so that they can come and look at the project and assess it. So we were doing fun things in the Discord. You know, the Discord is kind of your um, 
your cooking pot. You know, once you've already got all the ingredients, you can cook up something awesome in the Discord. But you need to go and gather those ingredients and you know gather gather people who are going to feed on that first. And that's where we were probably neglecting the Twitter side of things and didn't have enough of a plan around collaborations when we did that project. So yeah, my my core piece of advice is um, find out who your complementary partners would be in your space before you start. Um, and, and kind of work out what those communities might need that you can offer as a, as a decent partner. Um, you know, for us, you know, we got, we have obviously utility for our partners in, in partner pets that can be used in games. Um, but also, uh, things like for a couple of our top tier partners, the ability to wager their tokens in the jeweler. Um, so having a, a plan for not just what you can deliver your holders, but what you could potentially deliver holders of partner projects, that's kind of the gateway to growth. If you can bring on a few big partners early and kind of work your way up potentially even from small partners to big partners, that's going to be your recipe for exposure. And then your recipe for success from there is, do you actually have a fundamentally good product? So you kind of have to do both uh, that networking piece and have a great product. You can't neglect the, the early networking side. So what is PX Quest then? What's a, what's a TLDR on what this game is? <laughs> um, so we are a P2E MMO RPG. That's a, a lot of letters and, and numbers. <laughs> a play to earn MMO RPG with a, a, an emphasis on um, fun as much as um, the earning piece. Uh, there's, there's obviously um, a plethora of um, kind of play to earn mini game type projects or even NFT projects where it's hard to even call it a game. It's like a website with some buttons and they talk about being played earned. That is not us. We, we are a genuine, um, you know, real-time game that we are building, uh, you know, in, kind of inspired by games like World of Warcraft, um, but uh, at a kind of more sensible scale for where we're at. Um, and, uh, you know, game, gameplay and actually having fun gameplay is, is the core and the fact that you can earn off that is really a benefit, but it shouldn't be the core reason why you come to the game. Yeah, so that's the TLDR. I'll stop there because then it's uh, definitely too long. <laughs> now it's where we can go into the long part then. Like, is this, so it's th this is not going to be a side scroller. It's it's literally going to be a proper, uh, I don't know, a Pokemon type of MMORPG. <laughs> no, so, it, so it's 3D. Uh, it is full 3D. Yeah. Um, it's got a kind of isometric angle to it. Um, you have basically two components to the game. There's a kingdoms layer and there's the raiding layer. So the kingdoms layer uh, is probably most analogous in some ways to a game like Animal Crossing, where you have uh, a bunch of your friends, you, you build up uh, a piece of land together by building different constructions on it, uh, gathering resources to build better constructions, uh, and you actually use those buildings to perform crafting activities. So that's how you make your items better, um, how you upgrade them, how you might get hold of new mounts or, or new pets as well. Um, and so kind of kingdoms mostly consumes and upgrades existing items. And then the raiding game is more like your traditional WoW dungeon. You kind of go through with a bunch of friends. Uh, we're trying to push the scale on that as well from kind of five man to 20 man uh, style raids. Uh, and you basically troll through, smash all your uh, mobs on the head, get dropped a bunch of loot. Uh, and then that loot kind of would feed back into the kingdom's economy. Uh, and this is where IMX is really key for us because on IMX, we obviously can do gasless drops and that allows us to uh, make it really accessible as a play to earn uh, where you're not having to, you're not having to pay to earn. You don't have to pay for additional resources just to progress in the game. And we're not doing the shadow pay to earn where, uh, you know, some games might have a, a cooldown on resources. That means you've got to wait a year if you're going to progress. And so you end up buying anyway. We're doing none of that nonsense. <laughs> the core way you get items and you progress in the game is by playing that raiding loop uh, and by coming back and building more stuff with your friends. Uh, and there's a big emphasis on collaboration there. So we, we have a couple of design principles. Uh, and one of the three core design principles is we need a, a game that requires collaboration because our most memorable gaming experiences um, required a lot of interaction between players. And that's what actually makes the gameplay loop more replayable is that when the more humans are involved, the more you're dependent on other humans, the more variety, the more randomness. Um, and so that's where, where kingdoms uh, really relies on you joining a kingdom or allowing others to join your kingdom. Uh, to actually build up and, and build resources and get better gear. And we're raiding, obviously, the combat styles are really geared towards mutually dependent classes that require you to play with your friends. Because we think that's where the, the heart of fun comes out. It's that human randomness 
uh, as much as it is, as it is uh, kind of progression um, and the, the rewards of that adrenaline rush of getting that great drop. Got it. So how is this different from, let's say, Guild of Guardians? It's a mobile game. Is this a mobile game, in fact? No, so this is a, a desktop game. So that's obviously one of the core differences. Being on desktop um, gives us a bit more freedom in terms of how far we push the graphics uh, and how um, how we push the scale of combat. So as I said, you know, we're looking at 21 raids uh, and hopefully um, reasonably large hordes of enemies. Um, if anyone has played um, games like Castle Crashers um, or there's Bazali, a, a console game that I think does, does its best, uh, Assault Android Cactus, uh, awesome music, great game to like just sit down with your friends and catch and play where you can have hordes of enemies. Uh, that That's what we're pushing for. That's why we've gone for a desktop experience. We also think that there's a bit of a gap in the market in terms of quality desktop gaming experiences that incorporate NFTs at the moment. So uh, we think we can capitalize that, capitalize on that and, and make a bit of a name for ourselves. Um, the other core difference is um, Guild of Guardians being on mobile. Um, it's probably a little more um, rating focused, um, kind of that simple, quick style of play. Um, our kingdoms layer is is at least kind of you know fifty percent of our game. So that crafting economy, the constructing, the teaming up with people to roam a kind of vast territory, that's probably where we're a bit different uh, at something else. Um, but uh, you know, I'm also a huge fan of, of what Guild of Gardens are doing. I think the offering they have is really well fit to mobile, and I think it's going to go really well in the mobile space. What do you feel PX Quest brings differently? So just in terms of um, what, like, so uh, Lachlan, you, you mentioned um, how, how the game is being and built and whatnot. Is that correct? Yeah. 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 So I've gone through the fact that it's kind of desktop. We're pushing there for, you know, a little bit in terms of graphics and scale. Um, and I've also talked about um, just that the crafting economy is, is a, a kind of big piece of what we're doing. Uh, but you could probably go into a bit more detail in terms of the, maybe the breadth and depth of that. Well, I mean, the thing that I, I really wanted to highlight, and it's been something that's um, something that our community has loved, is just um, the, the the origins of the project it uses an NFT project that does have profile pictures, and so um, the pixel art um, that we've kind of shown um, that's you know even though we're going for a three D game, there's that aspect of that. Um, cute art style um, that we're going for and the number of um, races and classes um, that we have is something that's not seen in too many um, games these days so I think in generation one I think we've got five different races um, six classes something like that Uh, with generation two dropping we've got an additional um, three races and um, four classes as well but yeah so so just the, the number of races and classes that we have but just that um, variety yeah. um, just to cater to um, you know people that grew up playing games I'm sure a lot of people played World of Warcraft and they would have their their favorite class and so I'm confident that you know people from all walks of gaming life will be able to join PX Quest and find something that matches their play style and is quite nostalgic um, for them as well. Yeah, I think it's going to be a bit of a different art style. You've got your like really hardcore, um, serious looking games at the moment with full realism and, and you know, the, the blood splatters everywhere. And then at the other end, you have very, very cartoonish games um, that might even just be like cell shaded. And I think we're, we're finding this nice middle where you're not sure if your character is cute or vicious. And that's the, the, the kind of <laughs> phrase that I keep putting to the to art team as we're doing the modeling. I should be unsure if this guy is going to kind of bite my head off or if I want to cuddle him. He's going to find that like nice middle ground. <laughs> so I think uh, hopefully, particularly being NFTs, you know, there's been a big focus for us on ensuring that every character, every item, every piece of the world that you might own, it all needs to be lovable because if you want someone to actually trade that and, and have value to that, um, you need people to be attached to it. Uh, so that that's where we put a lot of thought into the styling of of, of every model, and I, I think uh, it comes through in the in the avatars, like the the profile pictures. I think they're a bit different. You you see a PX Quest, you know immediately it's a PX Quest. You're not going to confuse it with another project. Uh, and I think the 3D models that we've started to shop around, people will will have seen. You get the same kind of vibe. Like it's it's distinct for sure. Awesome. Where are you exactly? in the journey of building this game? Is it is there a playable game already or um, are we just in the in the cusp of it? So we're pretty early. Uh, we have a jeweler mini game coming out uh, next month. And that, uh, that's got reasonable levels of, of sophistication for a jeweler. So um, we'll be putting up uh, our Gitbook hopefully tomorrow, which will detail some of the, the moves and complexities in there. Um, that's quite enjoyable just as a really just a, a piece of fun to keep people chill. 
until we get to a, a beta um, of the dungeon rating, which should be around August. Uh, so we're, we're pretty early in terms of that. Um, but I think we'll have some sneak peeks for people um, in the next month or two as well, just to, to make sure people can see some tangible progress and, and more so just to get some early feedback on the, the direction we're taking around art style. Um, we made a big transition from, from pixel art to 3D uh, and that, uh, that definitely caused commotion in the community. Some people loved it. Some people were really frustrated by it. So, so that's been a, a really interesting journey as well. Um, but uh, yeah, we're we're kind of early now, but we've got some some nice juicy bits of utility to bridge, you know, the the next couple of months of development. Particularly the jeweler, I think, is going to give everyone a lot of fun and a lot of reason to uh, to start trading again to get different combat styles and uh, potentially even pets will start to come into the mix of the jeweler as well. Ah, pets, love pets. Awesome. Who could you give us a sneak peek as well of who is building the game? Like, what? Um, how big is the team? I'll touch on that. So uh, we're, uh, we've partnered with um, Ammo Box Studios, which is a um, game development studio um, in uh, Malaysia. So um, I'll actually just chuck in something into um, the chat, actually, which has the um, link to uh, their most recent, um, with their flagship game, which is um, 3D. So uh, what we've found with um, Ammo Box is that they've got a proven ex uh, ability to you know execute on a uh, high fidelity online multiplayer game with you know quite complex uh, mechanics, and uh, they're actually dedicating um, 25 um, staff to our game. So it's actually a it's a, it's a pretty it's a very sizable um, team, and you know we we see Southeast Asia as the um, the home and the heart of like the um, play play to earn movement, and you know the devs are you know native to this region, and they're, you know got better insights and connections to the market that, that we do. And so we also, you know, have a shared vision with them. They've helped, you know, improve on our ideas, um, helped us make smarter decisions. Their CEO has been, um, you know, involved from day one and has been uh, extremely actively involved. So, and, you know, we've got a long-term partnership and we're, you know, they're here to see our game through to, um, to, to make it a success. You know, we've got a, a shared um, revenue agreement um, with them as well. So they're, they're invested um, in this game uh, for the long term. Awesome. So the thing that you just showed us, the translation from 2D to 3D, is that it? Or was it uh, the YouTube that you wanted to highlight? So the first uh, was a 3D model translation. So our NFTs are in uh in pixel form um but then each of them uh, will have an in-game 3d representation so that's what's on the google drive and then the youtube um is just a, a game pay, gameplay trailer of eximus which is our co-development partner ammo boxes um flagship um product so just wanted to kind of demonstrate their um kind of experience um building you know complex online games kind of thing so it's not going to be in the same um you know, it's not our game's not going to look like that because it's you know a very different genre, but the, the capability is definitely there. Awesome! No, this looks great. So everybody who has their pixel art uh, avatar right now, they can basically expect that it will be translated to that kind of three D model, right? Yeah, which I think uh, maybe not everyone's going to yet. Like that's the that's the future, obviously, that you'll be able to have both a a three D and a pixel version of your NFT, and a, and like more than just a pretty you know, 3D model, it's your game character that you're going to be running around and bonking things on the head with. Cool, that's great. And what were your inspirations for this? Like, where did this uh, pixel art slash genre slash concept come from? <laughs> um, so I think overall um, inspirations, as we said, like Riot Games have been just um, mm. paving the way in terms of experimentation with art, really strong art and music combinations. Um, but, but also, yeah, classic experiences like WoW, uh, Zelda, even recent mini games, uh, not mini games, smaller games like Tunic, uh, where uh, they they take a kind of um, simpler, cuter style, uh, endear you to it with you know subtle graphical effects, whether it be that um, just that that lens effect they've got in Tunic that makes you feel like every character is kind of a mini model, <laughs> um, that kind of a, a artistic uh, tweaking to perfection. Uh, has really inspired us um, and the kind of world scale and immersion of games like Zelda and, and WoW and, and Final Fantasy XIV. Um, I think uh, the collaboration side was something I talked about earlier. Uh, we we kind of pinned that early as a, a, a key principle that we needed to focus on. Uh, and, you know, games like League of Legends um, really emphasize, you know, replayability coming from complexity of interaction between the players and the cooperation and, and building up that loop. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're, we're focusing on, on that, not just for the rating game, but the kingdom building side, um, not being a crafting economy that you do in isolation, but one that you do as a, as a team, as, a, as citizens of a kingdom, that you'll have to kind of gather resources and build off each other um, to build something great. Um, and then I also, I want to touch on Animal Crossing one more time. I, I love that um, that yeah. game in particular, it doesn't really have a single definition of success. There's not like an end game for Animal Crossing. Half the joy of right. that game is just the, the kind of beauty of it and construct it, the joy of like constructing something new, the kind of freedom of expression of how you lay your little land out, what you do there, um, and, and kind of bringing other people in to see what you've made and to show that off. Uh, and that's something that uh, we're really trying to bring into kingdoms so that uh, you have some freedom in terms of what you build and how you build and where you build uh, and, and how you kind of style those things. Uh, because I feel like that that becomes a kind of very, very relaxing style of game to itself when you're, when you're perhaps, you know, you're a long day, uh, you, you kind of don't feel like playing a really intense you know, dungeon. You still have that more chill environment to go back to and you know we're building in things like kind of weather effects and and those things that give you that feel that this is a real world that I can come back to and, and kind of have some solace and and kind of play around with uh, with making something uh, pretty and and showing that off to my friends. Awesome. Um, you touched on a lot of different things regarding learning from different games, even at the start of this AMA, learning from uh, what Immutable has done, for example, Gods and Chain and Guild of Guardians. What is your thesis slash uh, learnings from the play to earn economies that we've seen today what are what are, what do you think are the issues and how are you counteracting that yeah so i think the the core issues at the moment are really twofold one is that there is just not enough focus on the gameplay like they are kind of well designed maybe economies if they get that right and then the gameplay is almost an afterthought it's like just good enough to keep you playing uh, and really just hitting those like hormone addictive, <laughs> those addictive hormones that kind of keep you pressing that button. Um, and I think that doesn't lead to longevity. That leads to burnout. That leads to, to frustration with players. Uh, so, you know, our focus is, you know, play to earn is a benefit of what we build. It's not the, the driving force of every decision in the game. You know, gameplay has to come first um, while managing the, the expectations that you can earn from playing. Um, the other core issue I see with current play to earn economies is um, too many micropayments to actually achieve basic progression in those games. So as I mentioned earlier, the kind of shadow microtransactions mm -hmm. where you know you might technically be able to to you know build that building or play through to that layer if you grind for a year, but obviously no one's gonna do that. And so they end up going to the marketplace and buying extra of some resource or whatever just to progress. Uh, and that was something just philosophically we didn't want to touch. Um, and I think it holds back the genre because especially for, you know, the Southeast Asian space, um, you know, lower income economies, we want to make sure that there's an easy on-ramp uh, and that you can progress um, the game and, and really just kind of make a pure kind of profit from your, your gameplay experience. Uh, without that being investment advice, uh, you know, the, the things we're concerned about is making sure that there's as minimal upfront costs as possible. So that's why, one, we obviously had to choose a gasless um, blockchain so that we could drop things to you for free so you could perform trading actions without gas. Um, the, the other thing is we, we just decided to, to model the, the style of, um, of crafting so that you didn't have to pay for, for resources. Um, you could get any resource you needed just from playing the raiding game or the, the kingdoms game with other players. So there shouldn't be any barrier in our gameplay that requires payment at any form. We feel that you know picking up an adventure is already a significant investment for our early, early holders. Um, and then you know for later phases, if the community approves, we would go to more of a um, free to play model um, for slightly less um, valuable adventures at uh, a large scale so that you could literally just pick up and start playing the game without any cost to yourself. Yeah, awesome. Talking about um, getting those resources, the way I translate that into my head is supply, which I think slots in quite nicely with a question from the community, specifically from Silva. Um, Silva says, they're curious how you'll tackle any deflationary measures needed for the economy itself. Since pay-to-earn games usually spiral into a point where supply ramps further than anything the demand can handle. So I, I kind of think I know where Silva is coming from or 
what the meta what the allusion is to, but yeah, I would leave it to Rudy and Lachlan to answer this question. Yeah, look, it's one of the most common um, questions raised of play to earn. Um, I think yeah. like that the solutions are fairly straightforward one. It's just you need to have exponential curves to a lot of your resource yields. Um, and you need to couple that with reasonably consistent releases of new content, you know, like wow, for example, they did just pr slowly progress the level cap and, and release new content. Um, I think the, the trap that um, a lot of play to earn games fell into is they didn't have particularly replayable content. And so that meant they needed to have a reasonably fast um, kind of pr progression. Uh, and that meant that they didn't end up having an exponential yield because people were just not going to grind the exact same experience over and over again. They ended up having um, faster uh, faster yields, um, non-exponential yields, I should say. Um, they ended up having uh, too fast a yield on, on uh, most of their resources and tokens so that obviously the price became um, unstable. Uh, so for us, you know, the focus to keep those um, tokens valuable is, one, to make them increasingly difficult to get as you go up the you know the the quality of the the item as it were uh, and two to ensure that there was there's plenty of replayability so that if there is a long grind to get to those later items that it's an enjoyable grind that there is um, for example randomization of the position of enemies in dungeons so that if you play the same dungeon 10 times you're going to get potentially very different experiences playing that dungeon um, and I think uh, the final piece is um, to not get too caught up on trying to have a um, an in-game currency that is that is uh, pegged to real-world value, because not only does that kind of have legal issues, but it does um, it does but just become this like constant sink of um, folks are, are producing X and you need to produce Y for it to be spent on. Um, whereas if you focus more on items, items naturally you know are burnt and upgraded. Uh, there's many different ways you can destroy them. Um, where it's just pure kind of cash style tokens in your economy, I think are, are dangerous. Um, so that's why we have the Kronos token on the main net. That's really for utility to Genesis holders for particular types of things at particularly kind of high prices. Uh, whereas in game, you know, our, our currency in game will not actually be a token, uh, only the items themselves are tokens. Ah, that's interesting. So there won't be any ERC20 tokens in the game. We don't plan anyone now. Uh, awesome. Okay. Very interesting approach. Cool. So, Sylvia, if you have follow up questions, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, moving on to the next one. How, can you talk us through your NFT hybrid architecture? I'm not sure if you've already mentioned this, Rakhlan or Rudy. But, uh, yeah, we, we obviously um, started off our project on mainnet because that was where the, the most liquidity was, the biggest marketplace was at the time, uh, which was a good fundraising exercise. Um, but ultimately not suitable to actually play a game where, uh, you know, we want to play to earn, we want to reduce the, the friction costs on, on every trade, um, and, and we want things to be particularly fast. So uh, mainnet was our on-ramp, whereas um, Immutable X is where we're actually going to take off and deliver the game. So a hybrid architecture means that we can recognize items on both chains. Uh, you can obviously move items between both chains. You can have your item on IMX and withdraw it to mainnet. Um, but that the, the majority of, of tokens produced in the game, the vast majority will live on IMX where you, and get certainly will be airdropped to an IMX where, you, where you'll have the, the least kind of frictional cost to yourself. Definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah, I, I, I think it would actually be quite interesting for people to know. What is the back end of building a game, Rudy, that people wouldn't usually think about now that you've had two experiences uh, doing it? Yeah, yeah, look, so it's a lot of the, the key decisions come down to how much do we build up the resources in-house and how much do we outsource and partner with other people that have that expertise. And so I think what was just clear from the beginning, um, you know, Lachlan has a lot of um, blockchain development expertise and we decided to continue to build that um, development in-house. So we brought on another developer from the UK just over the past week who's got a lot of experience on different projects uh, but at the same time we're also partnering with a, a blockchain company in uh, Brisbane uh, by the name of Labris and so um, you know what we can't do um, they're, they're doing as well um, for a lot of the, the art stuff um, we've you know all of the art that um, you see that's been produced from PX Quest um, we've built that um, team out ourselves so uh, predominantly um, from Southeast Asia uh, and then when it comes to the actual game development um, so 
you know, when, you know, I think it'd be crazy for us to go and try to build um, something of this scale by ourselves. And so that's why we went out and evaluated a bunch of different partners and, you know, came to a conclusion that Ammobox um, was the best fit. Um, so I think a lot of um, people also just don't realize, um, you know, with, with these, when you're trying to take, I guess, an NFT project to, I, I guess, um, more of a, you know, a play to earn game, um, there's a lot of stuff that happens in the background in terms of, um, you know, setting up the, you know, appropriate um, company and legal structures, um, having agreements in place um, with um, employees. So, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're always building stuff. And so we're building up our intellectual property, not just um, in terms of um, art, but in terms of code as well. And so that all needs to be um, protected. And so, um, you know, there's a lot going on in the background to just make sure um, that's all set up. So um, I think, you know, the NFT space is so fast moving people, you know, there are projects that are being, you know, you know, pumped out all, all the time. But I think in terms of what's going to help a project um, be sustainable for the long term is that, um, you know, the proper structures and foundations are, are in place. And I guess it's just more of a lot of the boring stuff. But I, I think it's just important that it's done because ultimately um, that structure in place provides, um, you know, value to our holders in the long term. Mm. And I think the hiring thing, uh, it's it's so easy to just underestimate um, how how much effort it takes to find the right fit for each role. And, you know, especially say like um, on the art side, you know, we went through like maybe a dozen or two um, a kind of artist trials to find one just of the quality we thought we needed for, for the pixel art piece alone. And you know, we have one person who was really really strong in the actual character concept art um, and wasn't so strong in the animation. So we have a different person who's actually doing the animation of the pixel art. Um, so finding really good people, uh, whether it's art or, or the technical side as well, like like blockchain, where those skills are, are kind of more few and far between, uh, that's going to consume a lot of your time when you, as soon as you have that first um, kind of payday from from your project launch. So the earlier you can have those people lined up, you know, pre um, pre mint, uh, the better. You kind of want names and faces and, and CVs in front of you so you can get going. Um, and certainly one of the things we realized with game development was we were just not going to move fast enough hiring internally. Uh, so I think choosing a game studio partner was a, a massively good decision. Uh, it became you know, more and more evident afterwards as, as we kind of have worked through the complexities with the studio, just how many people with different skills you need and how long it would have taken to hire, not just the people, but build a cohesive team of people who know how to work with each other and know each other's skills and, and who to hand what at what time. Um, so I think, yeah, if, you, if you're looking at a, a similar style project, um, Find that that partner early with you know set teams that do set jobs. Labris have been really good for that purpose as well as a as a blockchain company. They have kind of set team that they've given us who know how to work with each other and who we can independently give a whole task and just kind of know end to end that that will get taken care of. Um, I think that's a good model to operate, particularly at this kind of zero to one hundred pace that uh, that NFT projects often go through from kind of launch, where you know pre-launch you don't know exactly how big you will be. Uh, you can set a mint price. You still don't know if you'll, you know, sell out uh, to the next couple of months, where your your holders are obviously going to expect value as fast as possible. So the the sooner you can line up hires, the better. Yeah, definitely. I think this is this is also part of the reason why these AMAs, in my mind, are so valuable. It just gives people, the holders, the community, a sneak peek of what exactly happens behind the scenes and how how the teams are building value for them uh, when. Uh, well, sometimes people just forget that, oh, the token, that's it. But so many things line up just so that we can produce that token that adds, that creates value for them, uh, which I think is super valuable to understand. Uh, cool. Now, I in terms of like what's going to happen next, what's within PX Quest's roadmap? What's going to happen in a few months, in six months, in a year? What should they expect? Yeah, so um, obviously uh, Gen 2 is like just around the corner. We're, we're kind of finishing up um, the art for that at the moment, as well as a Gen 1 re-release. So the whole Gen 1 collection is being re-released in animated form. Uh, I haven't seen many other projects um, with this many tokens do an entirely animated collection. So that's that's exciting and also a technical challenge to, to deliver and, and ensure kind of consistency. Um, so that, that's all going to happen this month. Um, the jeweler is probably the, oh, I'm sorry, the whitelist marketplace, uh, that will also happen in the next, uh, week I'm thinking even, uh, and then the jeweler as well, uh, next month is, is the next 
kind of thing um, on my mind, which we've been working on pretty hard. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, that's going to be exciting because it's a, probably a bit more sophisticated than people might have thought. Um, and uh, yeah, you get to start to see your characters in a bit more of a lively, slightly more animated fashion as well, which is cool. Um, but I'll let Rudy take on in terms of the, the kind of remaining roadmap, the kind of key hurdles this year. Yeah, so just, I mean, just in terms of our, what, what's, you know, our, our big delivery of our roadmap is is the main um, role, role playing game. So uh, in, in terms of um, what we're looking at releasing, you know, obviously first is the jeweler, but then um, you know, we've got single player dungeons, um, crafting and land development beta. Um, and towards the end of the year, we're looking at the um, multiplayer dungeons beta um, being released as well. And then when we go into early next year, we're looking at the full release of crafting and land, um, as well as the general availability of the multiplayer dungeons. And so I think, you know, alongside that, you know, there's a game development, you know, happening, I guess, in one lane. Um, on In another lane, um, what we've been doing more recently um, are what we've called um, PX Quest Guild Spaces, uh, where we invite, you know, uh, one or two, you know, pretty big hyped projects um you know onto the stage on twitter spaces and we you know, we kind of do like an ama um session with them and so that's all about um providing you know value to our existing holders and the broader um nft community to you know obviously bring exposure to the px quest project but also just provide a platform for new projects that we feel are um, worthy to um to, to promote themselves on our platform as well so um just like a I, I would say it's, a, I guess, a source of alpha um, uh, for the community. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of happening in parallel. And, you know, we're, we're always exploring um, other avenues of um, what we can be doing. Because, you know, I think it's quite clear from the feedback from the community is like people um, love our art and the world that we've built. And so, you know, Lachlan and I are always tossing up, oh, do we want to do a webcomic or something like that just to build up the law um, just alongside um, all of these other releases? So I think, um, you know, in this space, there's just so many things that we could potentially be doing, but we really need to focus on what we think is best for the um, longevity um, of the game. But, you know, also thinking about how do we provide value to our holders as well. Yeah, there's an interesting um, trade-off, well, not even trade-off, just a split of resources required um, between there's a, most projects are not doing an MMORPG, right? Most projects are an NFT project that tries to give little pieces of token utility in a kind of constant stream. Uh, and so the floor of what folks expect from just an NFT project being an NFT project um, with little bits of utility uh, is lifting all the time. It's going up. And so we, we you know, do things like the whitelist marketplace, um, some of our community events and, and making more of those to kind of keep up with that. Uh, but we also have to keep in the back of our mind that, you know, our core attention still has to be on the main deliverable and, and not sacrificing too much time and resources away from that. So it's been an interesting challenge to kind of okay. juggling that, trying to trying to keep a finger on the pulse of the community and making sure we're meeting short-term expectations, the kind of continuous delivery, continuous rewards piece, uh, but also making sure we're getting on with the, the main job of, of delivering a, a quite big, quite complex um, gaming offering. So it's always a constant battle between Lachlan and I because I'm like <laughs> hassling like our dev team to pump out marketing assets. So I've got stuff for Twitter and whatnot. And then, you know, they're focused on, you know, user authentication, backend stuff. And I'm like, doesn't matter. We need we need something to put on Twitter, you know. So it's, <laughs> but, you know, obviously like we want to, we, we need to find that um, really, really delicate balance. So. No, I totally agree. For the people here that are new to the PX class concept and community, could you do a quick explanation of what is Gen 1 versus Gen 2 uh, versus the whitelist market? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll touch on that. And maybe Lachlan, if you wanted to add anything. So um, Generation 1 NFTs uh, was a collection of 5,000 adventures that uh, we launched in mid-January. I think we sold out within um, 24, 24 hours. So they're, they're on the um, Ethereum um, mainnet and they're being actively traded on um, OpenSea on the secondary market. Our Generation um, 2 adventures... Um, are produced from breeding two generation ones and a um, certain amount of Kronos, which is our um, which is our token as well. And um, from generation two, we've got three additional. Oh no, sorry, five additional races and four additional um, classes. So uh, yeah, so generation two it just comes from breeding of two generation uh, ones. And then the whitelist marketplace as well is something that we've um, seen asked by the community um, because we, we do a lot of collaborations and partnerships with big hyped projects and we typically give these away um, just through you know Twitter and Discord giveaways. Um, but instead we're looking at 
um, opening up a, a whitelist marketplace where um, people can um, spend their Kronos, which have earned by holding their adventurers, um, to purchase whitelists um, for the projects that they want. Yeah, and there's a couple other fun bits of utility there. So um, you get your Kronos without actually having to stake. Uh, that's a kind of passive staking, which is cool. Uh, but you can also actively stake your adventurer um, to unlock the game's only flying mount. And that's the only way you're going to get that flying mount. So that's a, that's a kind of cool win for just the Genesis uh, holders. Uh, we also do um, partner pets. So uh, particular projects that we think bring utility to our community. Uh, we offer dual holders, so holders of their token and holders of our adventurers, um, an opportunity to get a partner pet for free uh, airdrop to them. They just have to hold both for, for a certain two week snapshot. Uh, so our most recent partner was Just Cubes, and they're the first of season three, uh, which is potentially the last of the partner pet seasons we will do. So um, if you are representing a, a project with interesting utility that you could bring, uh, get in touch because this might be the last window to kind of get your holders um, a, a pet. And those pets are usable in-game. So they uh, float around with their adventure. They give you um, stats boosts and other buffs in combat. Uh, and there is uh, some possible integration of those in the jeweler, uh, which I don't want to confirm just yet um, because we want to see what the, the response is to the, the release of the jeweler uh, before we commit to throwing in all the pets and all the, the, the kind of complexities of their mechanics into the combat system as well. We really want to make season three pets, um, you know, like a go out with a bang because I think season one and two, we had a, quite a few big names like uh, Stinky Vampire Syndicate. Um, Nano Pass, Kaiju Kings, Wolf Sanity, Llama Verse. So there are there are a number of really big um, projects that we were able to partner with, like um, you know pre mint and then post mint. We're looking at you know s similarly what other projects that we can partner with that have a high amount of you know utility. What further integration um, is there? So not just a not just a simple you know marketing exercise for promotional activities. We're thinking about what can actually you know be done to bring more value to the holders. Yeah. And then obviously the um, the final um, generation, generation three, that's um, subject to community vote. So as long as the community holders um, give a vote at, of approval close to the time, that's where we can achieve that massive scale um, required of a, a kind of serious game beyond the, the 7,500 by then adventurers. Um, and that will most likely be a free to play generation. Uh, so it'll be an airdrop with some slight differences and, and not none of the same uh, races as generation one and two. So gen one and two will retain their scarcity. Uh, they'll retain some stats advantages um, and then potentially some other tweaks we'll put in there just to make sure those Genesis holders feel they, they kind of get their value. And then gen three will be your more generic, uh, just maybe one or two races uh, for the free to play model to, to allow us to achieve that scale, which ultimately you know benefits everyone. If you only have a, a playable community of 7,500, that's only you know, at most 7,500 people that are ever going to trade your resources with you. If we can hit that much larger scale, then that's going to actually bring the, the value up, uh, particularly of those items that are only accessible to Genesis holders through things like Kronos purchase. Um, so uh, we're pretty confident community will approve of that. We've already got pretty strong positive feedback from the committee on that. Awesome. I have one more question, but besides that, was there anything you wanted to give key takeaways for the community? We, we did want to uh, do a giveaway, and I'll check the details in the event text under the town hall. Um, we are giving away two Generation 1 adventurers, and one of which is a mechanized, which is uh, only 10% of the collection is mechanized, so that's quite a rare one. And so I'll put the details in there, but just in, uh, I mean, in, in terms of um, key takeaways, uh, Lachlan and I are both like, very like um, set on having our artistic vision um, realized through this game. And I hope people can see like the love and passion and care that's gone into the existing art so far. And we really want to deliver something that's genuinely um, fun to play. And I think, you know, during a lot of my like early days, like researching like Axie Infinity and whatnot, and I thought, is this something that I should be getting into? It looks like it's fun. But, you know, when I dug a bit deeper and you go into Reddit, people say, you know, if there was no financial incentive, I wouldn't would not be playing this game. It just ends up being a grind, and that's not what PX Quest is about. Where we're here to we're here to build a genuinely fun game. Yeah, I can really just second that. Like, if you've been holding out, waiting for genuinely good gaming to come to NFTs, um, then you know, look no further than PX Quest, and you know, also other games coming through on IMX, uh, Gods Unchained, and um, Guild of Guardians. I think uh, we want to be in that company. 
uh, and kind of seen as, as one of those really serious players delivering a, a really serious, high quality um, gameplay experience. Awesome. Um, in, in that case, I would love the final question to be, what is that one fun thing that people can expect to do in, in PXCraft? <laughs> Um, it's got to be loot. It's got to be loot, like collecting loot. I don't know <laughs> for any gamers out there, but yeah, Rudy, Rudy's a goblin. He loves the shiny. Um, <laughs> I think for me, it'll be like, <laughs> the first time you like hop on your Hasari mount and you like fly over your kingdom and you see all the stuff you've built and you're like, yeah, that's that's my kingdom. Those are my people. Uh, that's the moment I'm waiting for. <laughs> I think it's just for me the aspect of loot that you can actually. Like you can build up and then if you want to sell it, you want to trade it, like you have that flexibility to do that. Like I've just spent so much time and money in games previously and I actually, I still don't, like I've got a massive collection, but it's tied to my account that, you know, if I want to leave the game, I want to play another character or whatever, it's kind of just, it's kind of stuck there. So I think just blockchain technology and immutable enabling that for our game is just something that I'm excited about. Awesome. Loot. Uh, somebody just said fat loot, of course. <laughs> <laughs> looking, looking forward to that for sure. Uh, awesome. And I guess that's a great way to end this uh, AMA. Thank you very much, Rahman and Rudy. No, thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks for hosting us, Nigel. Thanks, everybody, for listening and really appreciate the support from the community.